Well, it's an impressive testament to British punctuality that we're actually going to start a little bit early. Uh, so, and it's my great pleasure, <coughs> particularly, I think, to welcome our guests from Norway uh, and the United States uh, to this discussion, uh, which I'm really looking forward to. I'm Malcolm Chalmers. I'm Deputy Director General here at RUSI, and this meeting is is called to launch uh, our latest Whitehall paper, which is about NATO's uh, role in the North Atlantic. Uh, and of course, the North Atlantic is actually in the name, the clue is in the name of NATO. But I think uh, we'd all agree, and this is one of the themes uh, of the volume, that for quite a long period after the end of the Cold War, uh, there was a lot of attention certainly by many NATO states uh, in terms of their maritime postures on power projection outside the immediate NATO area uh, because the threat changed uh, and the world changed. Uh, and having gone through a period, particularly in the latter half of the Cold War, but actually through the whole Cold War in which so much emphasis of NATO maritime effort was on the North Atlantic, I think it's fair to say that the period after uh, 1990 for a couple of decades, uh, the attention was, was shifted elsewhere. But what this volume is doing, and it's a result of collaboration between experts from our three countries, is to address the question, uh, what does uh, increased Russian assertiveness, including increased Russian maritime assert assertiveness, mean uh, for NATO's posture how it organizes itself, what resources it devotes uh, to the North Atlantic. Uh, and I'm absolutely delighted uh, to be one of the, the co-authors uh, for that volume. We've got two chapters from each of the three uh, main countries uh, here. And of course, each country has slightly different perspectives in these issues because of geography and history and their own particular national interests. But what strikes me, I think, from this volume, and I hope strikes you when you read it, is how much convergence there is, but also I think how central, good, honest, and close collaboration between our three countries will be in addressing the problems which this volume, uh, this volume discusses. So uh, for those of you who are not RUSI members, because RUSI members will get a copy of this in the post, you may already have done so, but for those of you who are not RUSI members, copies of the volume will be available for sale uh, just outside for a very modest uh, £20, uh, and our publication staff will be available to, to sell those to you. The way we're going to organise this discussion is I'm going to ask uh, the speakers in turn to speak briefly for five minutes uh, to summarise some of the issues which they've addressed in their chapter, and then we'll have plenty of time for discussion. I think, as I recall, up until around about uh, four o'clock, uh, and then there will be uh, a drinks reception uh, outside. So the first speaker we have is uh, Rolf Tamnes, who's a professor, professor at the Norwegian Institute for Defence Studies. Rolf, please, over to you. Uh, thank you, Malcolm. It's great to be here, and distinguished guests and ladies and gentlemen. Let me start by pointing out uh, the sad fact, I would say, that the Western liberal societies and indeed the international order is under pressure from external and internal forces. And in this uh, context, uh, NATO's most uh, pressing concern is that uh, Russia is uh, challenging the collective defense and the political cohesion of the West. Uh, I would uh, say that U.S. priorities might become uh, decisive in dealing with Russia, but also the re re related question of whether NATO Europe and the countries in Europe, whether they are prepared to shoulder a larger share of the costs. You know all these, uh, uh, rather the, the, these questions nowadays, which is closely connected. One could argue that uh, the future doesn't belong to Russia. Uh, because after um, a decade of growth, Russia's economic and political system is about to resemble 
the Soviet era stagnation. But yet uh, I would argue that uh, Russia has uh, succeeded in building military capabilities which constitute a challenge to the defense of Western Europe. In the forward eras, of course, but also more broadly by establishing anti-access capabilities that could reach all Europe and far into the North Atlantic. One part of the problem is that an arc of steel is descending across Europe from the Arctic to the Mediterranean. A number of anti-access bubbles based on precision guiding weapons such as S-400, Iskander, Calibre, KH-101. And the other part of the problem, and the interrelated one, is uh, the, uh, the, the Russian bastion defense in the north, which has been re-established after the turn of the century. Russia's mm -hmm. strategic submarines in the Arctic uh, are accorded very high priority, and in a conflict, Russia will make every effort to defend them by establishing sea control in the northern waters and sea uh, denial further down to the south and west down to the Gyoki Gap. The combination of anti-access bubbles across Europe and the bastion defense from the north stands out as a strategic challenge to the strategic, uh, transatlantic uh, linkage it threatens the bonds between North America and Europe, and that is the key message of my, cap of my chapter. Until now, we argue in the book, I argue in my chapter, NATO's response to a resurgent Russia has concentrated primarily on building forward defense in the Baltic states and in Poland, as you know. And it's also my one of the, my key points in the chapter that uh, NATO lacks a coherent approach to its northern flank and to the northern to the to, to the North Atlantic. Let me briefly, very briefly, mention some key issues that should be addressed and that are addressed in the book: a more adequate uh, maritime strategy, a command structure more fit for purpose, and military capabilities better prepared to deal with high-end conflicts. I would say that both Britain and Norway can make significant contributions to this common cause. Norway as a gatekeeper in the north and as a northern watch. Britain as an anchorage of the North Atlantic Bridge, as an angle in the northern triangle based on northern Norway, Iceland and the UK, and as a lead nation in a number of fields, forces, headquarters and so on. But I shall leave it to my colleagues here to elaborate on what is needed to form a more robust and credible NATO strategy for the future in the Mediterranean domain and in the North Atlantic. So thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much uh, indeed. And let me now turn uh, to my Rusi colleague, Director of Military Sciences uh, here at Rusi, uh, Peter Roberts. Peter. Um, thanks, Malcolm. The, uh, I guess I was really interested to read um, uh, General Breedlove's the Supreme Allied Commander uh, of NATO uh, until last year. His comment in the forward, which, which you know, I quote, "He must, we must have command of the sea." Unquote. I mean, this is a, this is a, a, a beautiful articulation of of wondering actually whether we have command of the sea now, uh, particularly North Atlantic. And and what struck me about reading the other chapters as as well as um, our own appreciation uh, of this was the history of the North Atlantic, which everyone goes back to, really looking from the 1970s, uh, and that period in the 1970s uh, where the intellectual effort of NATO shifted to a very continental mindset. Uh, and in the 80s, you saw this formalized in the airland battle doctrine. You saw the shift in uh, the arrival of precision-guided munitions, the use of tactical nuclear warheads, the availability of strategic airlift, meant the sort of subjugation of the maritime element of NATO, the move away from uh, the sea and very much into the land domain, the realization that you know the battle with the Soviet Union was not going to last for the six weeks it took to um, uh, redeploy uh, US forces into Europe. Uh, and this shift across slowly but steadily was continued after the end of the Cold War, where forces, as, as Malcolm beautifully made the point earlier, shifted into this expeditionary mindset that people moved away from thinking that there'd be a near-peer uh, adversary 
uh, with Russia. And going back to that period in the sort of the 70s, 80s, uh, was really important in how NATO conceptualized the sea space, how it moved away from this idea that it had sea control, um, that it was, uh, that, that sort of forgot that this great contested environment was central not only to the physical nature of NATO, but also the conceptual and intellectual base for the alliance. Uh, and that idea, I think, comes out really firmly in all the chapters, and to me was one of the most striking elements uh, of this, and is extremely important in that it gives context to the current challenges uh, that are coming out from uh, a revanchist Russia today. I think that sort of covers my end. Peter, thank you, thank you so much uh, indeed, and now it's my great pleasure, particular pleasure actually, to, uh, to turn to Heather Connolly, who's senior Vice President for Europe and Director of the Europe Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington and has come uh, here uh, for this meeting. So, Heather, over to you. Malcolm, thank you. Uh, it's great to be here and it was a privilege to be part of this uh, truly transatlantic project. Um, it, my uh, President and CEO, Dr. John Hamry, co-authored this chapter with me, and, and it's an unusual chapter. We don't usually go over such detailed history, but we felt very compelled to do this because we have, in fact, lost our memory of the Cold War. Now, some, this is very purposeful. Uh, we don't want to relive those memories. We don't want to go back into that context, but for many, it didn't exist. I'll give you my own personal example. I graduated from college in 1991. I'm dating myself, so I only know the Cold War through books and through lectures. There is a generation of policymakers that do not know what reforger means, what the GIUK gap is, what are active measures. We have US military officers in the last 16 years that have never served in Europe. Europe was a transit to go to Iraq or to Afghanistan. In fact, General Breedlove said that the Europe U.S. European Command was a, a capacity building command. It was not a war fighting command until 2014. In fact, uh, it has become so such a distant memory that a, a presidential candidate uh, in the United States can suggest that NATO is obsolete. It has grown distant from our memory. What purpose does NATO have? No one mm -hmm. even knows that the North Atlantic uh, is what uh, the NA in NATO stands for. So our task, quite frankly, is to educate very quickly a current and future generation of policymakers that have only known Russia as a partner, not an adversary. So in part, our chapter was designed to describe where the U.S. had once engaged in Europe at great strength at the height of the Cold War, but had pulled everything nearly out just at the time that Russia not only made its incursions into Georgia, but into Ukraine. And so we're trying to do uh, a significant uh, role in education. But at the end, we put forward some new ideas, and I think you'll hear that through all of the, the panelists here. So at the NATO summit in Warsaw last year, the alliance declared an enhanced forward presence for the Baltic region. And last month at the NATO Defense Ministerial, they just declared a tailored force presence for the Black Sea region. We suggest that the North Atlantic needs an enhanced northern presence. This may not be an immediate alliance task, that, but we believe the core regional countries the UK, the United States, Norway. Uh, certainly we look towards uh, other countries with maritime capabilities to help put forward what we argue we need a North Atlantic quad, for those of you who remember the quads of old days which brought uh, the US and the UK and, and France. Uh, Germany together, um, in some ways to bring in a little bit of bilateral, trilateralism in order to then get those capabilities to provide some critical uh, capabilities in the North Atlantic. We believe we have those capabilities in P8s, uh, which the United States will start uh, placing in a rotational basis at uh, Keflavik in Iceland. Again, ironically, the U.S. withdrew before F-15s from Keflavik in 2006. We are returning. 
Uh, you look at the U.S. force posture in Europe today, putting prepositioned supplies in, in warehouses that we had already removed from. History is uh, replete with uh, departure and then returning, and that's what we are in fact doing. We argue for uh, an enhanced uh, command and control, a little more robust uh, MARCOM. And I think again, in, in closing, the one new item that we're just beginning to understand, and this is where our Norwegian colleagues have helped us understand that, is the role that the Arctic plays in the North Atlantic. In the United States, uh, the United States is an Arctic nation, but we don't know that. We uh, don't uh, always understand that we are an Arctic nation by the Alaska, a little fun, fun fact, it's the 150th anniversary of the Alaska Purchase. And I remember at the time of the uh, annexation of Crimea, there was a hashtag, we want it back, uh, from our Russia colleagues. Hope that's not uh, <laughs> next up, but uh, just kidding. Um, but uh, it's in fact the Arctic that uh, is putting a lot more of our strategic focus in the north. And uh, the United States is uh, trying to understand exactly what that means as well. So with that, I'll finish. Thank you. Heather, thanks so much. And I can already see that the Arctic purchase uh, being uh, one of the headlines from, from this meeting. Uh, that, that might be a, a moment to remind us that all the speaker's remarks, initial remarks, are on the record. Uh, but any subsequent discussion is off the record. So uh, it's my pleasure now to turn to Admiral Peter Hudson, who's joint author with Peter, uh, uh, with our Peter Roberts uh, of one of the chapters, uh, who only retired from the Royal Navy last year and was uh, Commander Allied Maritime Command for some time before then. Peter, please. Markham, thanks very much. <clears throat> I think the, um, I I'm going to sort you through the lens of Marcom through the Maritime Commander for NATO, rather than through the lens of the United Kingdom, because quite a few of the issues that I'll touch upon apply to both. And I think it's, given the theme of the book, the NATO aspect is quite important. And the reason I raise that is that I was indeed in Marcom during that sort of period after 2014 when NATO had that internal examination on how it should restructure, the readiness action plan, and so on and so on. Quite reactive in many regards, but has delivered in most respects. And I think during that period, it would be fair to say, that NATO stood up, sort of took in a great deep of breath and looked east throughout that period and did fail, if I'm honest, to look over its shoulder at the Atlantic and what was behind it. Uh, and that is something which is yet to be, I think, properly addressed, although it's starting to be so within the NATO um, arena. The other thing I want to say is we need to keep perspective uh, about the Russian Navy. Um, it is not large. It is not particularly modern. Anyone who watched an old clapped out aircraft carrier limp down the English Channel will know just what I mean by that. However, as, as we've already heard, there are some key capabilities, some really essential areas where Russia has invested significant resource over recent years. We've heard about missiles, some of their smaller frigates, their newer submarines are particularly good, their C2. So it is not a navy that is static, but it is not a blue water oceanic navy that is going to confront NATO. We far outreach the Russian navy. So if you're going to invest in those sorts of capabilities, what do you want them for? Well, I think the first thing is for geographic protection. As we've already heard, their attitude for anti-access area denial for places like the Baltic, the Black Sea, the protection of their bastion forces up, up in the high north, play very much into those sorts of capabilities. And it's fueled by hybrid, ambiguous styles of warfare. So it's that connectivity that Russia has exemplified in Ukraine between all arms, their joint approach, their new headquarters to this in, in Russia, uh, I have to say in many respects has been very good. They have brought a discipline to their planning and they've brought a reactiveness and agility that certainly wasn't there 10 or 15 years ago. Now, why would they want to do that in a place like the Atlantic? Well, it's to fuel, in my view, uncertainty. It's to divide. It's to confuse planning. It's to protect their own strategic deterrent. It's to stretch the alliance's national focus, a nation's focus on its own protection against an alliance attitude. And of course, that is why, uh, although the Baltic has a very high profile for the Baltic states and so on, NATO, I think, has underestimated the resonance between the Atlantic and how that will play into the North and to the Baltic. And that's something we've got to address. 
So is NATO well placed? Well, in some regards, we are. We've got pretty good aspects of uh, ASW, particularly those nations that are running an SSBN force. They have kept some elements of that high-end ASW fresh to make sure that the integrity of their ballistic missile force is preserved. We've heard MPAs are on their way back to Keflavik. UK is correcting its error of 2010, reinvesting in MPAs, and so on. But overall, the force has shrunk. It has shrunk quite markedly. Training in many respects is shallow. We are not expending large amounts of effort on deep water uh, war fighting from a maritime perspective. Even the US Navy shoots across the Atlantic into the Mediterranean to go and operate in the central command region of, mm. of the Northern Inch. We don't dwell, we don't look at sustained free thinking in terms of warfare in the, in the ocean. So what should we do? Well, in my personal view, a lot of these problems have to be resolved through clear, unambiguous leadership. And in this respect, <coughs> there are too many confused and blurred lines between those who can and can't contribute to the alliance profile in the Atlantic. I'm not, I'm certainly not advocating uh, a restoration of SACLANT, but I am advocating greater empowerment of MARCOM as the single empowered voice for, for SACUR and the alliance as a whole. And I would also suggest that leadership at sea needs to be resolved, and that should probably come from the UK, the French, or the United States. That will allow us to fuse the thinking. We have a genuine advocate for the Atlantic, clarify the boundaries, and identify the differences between national, bilateral, and alliance responsibilities. But I have to say that even though 2014 we saw the challenges of Ukraine, I have been underwhelmed by the number of assets that have been put at NATO's disposal to exercise authority in the maritime area. And both at Wales and in Warsaw, the consistent message was showing authoritative, authoritative, credible deterrence in all respects, whether it's political or military. And in the maritime area, we need to restore that in the Atlantic so that we can show we can link between the US and Europe. We can make sure that hybrid amb ambiguous warfare doesn't interrupt with our wider strategies to provide deterrence <coughs> and safety for the Alliance members. Thank you. Peter, thank you so much. And our, for our final speaker, it's my pleasure to have Sven Efstad, who is the policy director of Norwegian Ministry of Defence, and if I may say so, one of the most eminent commentators on Norwegian and indeed European defence matters. Sven. Thank you very much, Malcolm. <coughs> and thank you also for including an old civil servant in this uh, exclusive party. <laughs> uh, I will, I've been asked to try to sum up the, the different chapters in this uh, book. and. Um, I will start by saying that the maritime strategy of NATO from 2011 needs to be, needs to be, um, uh, we, we need a new strategy for the maritime area. The security challenges today are very different from those foreseen in 2011. And um, we, we need to recognize the basic importance of NATO's supremacy in the North Atlantic. And I'd like here again to quote General Breedlove in his foreword. The North Atlantic is NATO's lifeblood. It is the transatlantic link. Therefore, it also basic mm -hmm. for collective defense, not only uh, in Northern Europe, but also elsewhere in Europe. Our maritime strategy should therefore also include a level of ambition for the North Atlantic. We must be able to establish sea control on relatively short notice at least a temporary sea control to ensure the flow of reinforcements and resupply from America to Europe. A new maritime strategy must be forward-looking and take into account emerging technologies and hybrid threats. Drones and new unmanned platforms can in the future pose tremendous threats to our forces as well as to maritime infrastructure, such as undersea cables for electricity or data or oil and gas pipes. We also need a new policy for training and exercises. We need to prepare our forces for joint and combined operations in the North Atlantic. This means preparations for high intensity warfare in the most difficult of circumstances, where our vulnerabilities and weaknesses will be exploited to the maximum. The lessons learned must be incorporated into future plans and operations at every level. NATO's command structure has been reformed several times after the end of the Cold War. There is agreement that the current structure is only partially fit for purpose 
and does not reflect current security challenges. This is particularly true for the North Atlantic and the northern flank. There is a strong case for the establishment of a joint command responsible for this area, a command that can direct activities in peacetime, do the necessary contingency planning, and form the headquarters for operations in crisis or war. A joint command can draw on resources from the force structure as well as to be linked to national headquarters around this area. There are well-qualified headquarters in the area. By double-hatting these, NATO will have much better capacity and better situational awareness. Such arrangements will also help provide a whole-of-government approach to crisis management in the countries adjacent to the North Atlantic. Experience show the need for unity of command, particularly in high-intensity joint operations. Such ar arrangements must be prepared and tested. After the end of the Cold War, Allied countries did not invest enough in high-end naval forces. We also need more focus on readiness, sustainability, and survivability. I know all nations in our area are working hard to improve our posture. The UK and Norway are investing in P-8, and the US is increasing its patrols out of Iceland. Uh, more uh, submarines and surface vessels will be built. The more capable F-35 aircraft will give much needed air power in the area. Um, we need to show military presence in the North Atlantic. Our objective is to provide effective deterrence and stability. This can and should be done in a non-provocative way. It is not in anybody's interest to create unnecessary tension in the North Atlantic or in the High North. We must continue to be firm and predictable in our military policy and activities. The North Atlantic is the transatlantic link. The link is just as important as before. Thank you. Mm, friend, thank you uh, so much. So all our speakers have been very succinct and I think very clear for which I'm very grateful uh, as chair. Uh, we are now off for the record. Uh, so any, uh, if there are any journalists here who want to quote anything said, you do have to approach the individual concerned <coughs> to get a quotation. And uh, if you could please introduce who you are uh, when you ask a question, I would be most grateful. Please, John.